So hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce Bruno Imbrizi. Bruno is a creative coder based in London. His work has been featured in Wired, Londonist, and Gizmodo, just to name a few. Bruno, would you like to tell us a little bit about your background in creative coding? All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this Lunch and Learn. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about creative coding, which I've been doing for, I don't know, maybe 15 years in one form or another. Uh, I am based in London. I've been living here for about 10 years, but I'm originally from Brazil, born and raised in Brazil. But as I said, I'm pretty much a Londoner now. And I think I can, we can talk about creative coding and I can show you a few things that will make more sense when you, when you see examples on the screen. So I'd say let's jump straight into it. Um, before we talk about creative coding, actually, um, we can talk about coding in general. First, about we can talk about coding and coding or programming. Traditionally, when we think about it, we think about uh, maybe apps or websites or backend systems, could even be online stores, data analysis, software to control robots, AI. The list is long. I could probably list 10 times more items here. We already have a few things associated with programming in general. And coding is always creative. It's always about solving problems. It's about architecting and planning and iterating and improving. So it's, it's difficult to write code without being creative. So what is creative coding? I don't know for a fact if it, the term came from, from this, but I think it came from the creative department in agencies where people started referring to the creative department as the, the 3D artists, the designers, the motion designers. So the people who are creating visuals uh, suddenly became the creative, creative department. So I think creative coding is associated with that. It's the use of code to create art, visuals, interactive experiences, prints, installations, projections, et cetera. You can even create sound with creative coding. But in general, I'd say it's, uh, the term is more linked to, to visuals. At least this is how I interpret it. If we borrow from Wikipedia, the definition there is, it is com computer programming using to create something expressive. Or if we generalize it even further, it is the use of code to create visuals. And normally it looks like this it, for a creative coder. We have a text editor with the code on one side and the result, the visual output uh, on the other side. So here's an example of something that I use personally. On the left-hand side, we see a text editor called Sublime Text with some JavaScript code. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, a browser, which is Google Chrome with the visual output. It doesn't have to be always like this. There's different types of environments, but I'd say in general, we can say that we have this two screen or split screen type scenario with some code and the visual output. I want to show you a quick demo. My, my intention is to show you something really simple, uh, just to, uh, as a demo of how to draw things with code. So on the right hand side, I have a browser with a, with a web page that for you, those of you who know HTML, we only have one element on the page, which is a canvas element, which is all we need in order to draw things with code. And on the left-hand side, I have some JavaScript. You don't need to worry about what's here. Essentially, we are creating an environment and a space to, to draw with code. We're obviously going to draw something simple. I'm not gonna take uh, spend too much time here, but just to, to give you a quick idea. The lines we're focusing on are these two here. Well, first we say that we have a context, which is the context where we're drawing. And then we're setting the fill style. So the name, I uh, should have prob probably already give it, uh, give it away. So it's the style of a fill color, something that we're, some shape that we're going to fill later and we're setting it to white. Then we go back to the context and set a uh, call a, a function, which is called fill rect. And then we fill a rectangle starting from X zero, Y zero, 
going to the width and height of the entire context. So it would be, we start from here, from the top left, and draw a white rectangle all the way down to the bottom right. Very simple, it's just setting the background white. If I change the background color to silver and save the file, we see an update here. So uh, the way that this is set up is every time I save this file, this gets updated automatically. Let's draw another rectangle. So something simple again, I'm gonna start with context, fill style, and I'm gonna set the color to dark blue. Then we're going to draw a rectangle with fill rect, and I'm going to start at 300, uh, 500, there's going to be 480 and 80. And if I save that, we get a dark blue rectangle in the middle of the screen. So this, these numbers here, they are on a 2D plane, starting from 0, 0 here at the top. So this means that we're moving 300 pixels on the x-axis, 500 on the y-axis, and then we draw something that is 480 pixels wide by 80 pixels tall. We can copy and paste those lines again, and this time I'm going to use a red color called fire brick, and I'm going to draw something a little bit lower. So we have now a blue and a red rectangles. And if I do that one more time, and I change the fill style to gold, and I change the position to 340, and the height to twice the height of these other two rectangles, 160, we get the flag of Colombia, which I promised when we had our initial call. It's the country of your colleague, Vanessa. She told me she was from Colombia and she gave me the yes. idea to do this. <laughs> uh, so this is a very simple example. We're only drawing three rectangles, but I wanted to, to show you maybe just to try to make a bridge between an image and the codes to create that image. You know, it gets complex and more interesting than only three rectangles. So let's go back to the presentation and I can show you some more examples there. Uh, where were, okay, this was that. All right, so that's it for our quick demo. And here I have a different example, which is a bit more complex but not terribly more complex than a few rectangles. We're still drawing rectangles with colors and they are clipped inside a shape, which is a triangle. And the rectangles create a pattern and the, the polygon, the triangle creates a mask. So perhaps something a little bit more compelling visually. And what, what I want to show is that the, the variation created by this is not too different from what we just did in that two, three minute demo. So here are the steps to create something like that triangle. We start by drawing a rectangle in the middle of the screen, just like we, we did before. This time it's, it's not a fill rectangle, it's, um, it's an outline. We take the corners of the rectangle and rotate them according to a given angle. We can change the angle, we can change the, the dimensions of the rectangle, width and height, uh, and then once we, we can draw one, we can draw multiple. And in this case, we're randomizing the sizes of the rectangles and we're randomizing their position on the screen. So it starts creating something like a pattern, like a, like a textile pattern. Here, uh, we add color. And again, the, this uh, color palette can be randomized. So it's not always the same. You just change a value and it changes the the look and feel of the, the whole thing. Here we had a bit more complexity. We double the outline. So there's a thin outline and a thick outline. We were filling the rectangles with color and also adding some transparency, some blend modes. Uh, we can add some shadows, just trying to make the pattern a bit richer. Then we introduce the clipping mask with the polygon. In this case, it's a, it's a hexagon. And we start, uh, now the, the pattern is, is revealed only inside the polygon. And in this case, I decided to use a triangle and I made the outline of the triangle a bit thicker 
and also added some blend modes to kind of have this membrane around it. And one interesting aspect of this is that the same code, if you change a number, if you change the, the seed that starts it, you get a very different result. So there's always a level of randomness that is welcome when you're using creative coding on, or when you're creating images with code. Here's just a sample of the, the output that can uh, come out of the same algorithm. And you could keep refreshing this and getting new images uh, forever. Obviously, after a while, they get quite a bit repetitive, but you can still generate a lot of output and some positive surprises can come up as well. Um, this example is something that uh, I used in one of my online courses. I'm assuming this is how uh, Brenda found me to invite me for this uh, lunch and learn. I have an online course on creative coding and I want to show you some other examples from the, the course. Here's something else that we create uh, in the course, which is uh, something using curves and using noise and a different way of operating with colors as well. I'm just trying to, to step up from what we started there, like drawing rectangles and trying to draw things slightly more complex. Here we have simple shapes, just arcs, but they are all reacting to sound. So uh, we read audio data and then draw based on the audio qualities or the, the audio properties. Uh, this is silent now, it doesn't make much sense, but you, I hope you can tell that this is kind of pulsing according to some music. And another example, this, this one is using particles, using uh, physics and cursor interaction. And we're also sampling the colors from, uh, from images. Uh, a few more examples. This is a different project. It's not part of the course. It's something called 36 Days of Type. Maybe some of you might have heard of this. It's a, I would call it an event. It's something that happens every year on Instagram. People post one letter per day. So the 26 letters of the English alphabet plus the numbers from zero to nine. And people post mostly illustrations, sometimes 3D models or motion design. Some people do it with code. Uh, I participated this year. I, I didn't do all the letters, to be honest, uh, but I did a few. So here's my letter G, which is, uh, again, everything done with code. And this is using, uh, I forgot the name of the algorithm, but it uh, just slipped through my, my mind now. Uh, reaction diffusion. It's called reaction diffusion. And it, you can see it's kind of organic. Um, there's another one that is kind of organic using a different uh, algorithm that I just thought looked good for the letter N. I just let it play out one more time. And a few more examples here is my ABC. Uh, different techniques for every, every letter. So some people just repeat the same technique and create the entire alphabet with one technique. Uh, some people create something completely different. I decided to use the, the theme of a letter as an excuse to experiment with something new every day. Uh, so probably some are better than others, but um, I like that all of them were an opportunity to, to experiment. Um, another example, some audio visualization, some, something I did with uh, just using pictures of brutalist architecture. I, I don't remember where this building is, maybe it's in Lithuania. Uh, I just like the, the picture and imagined how it could react to sound. Uh, so again, this is silent, but uh, I, can, I can give you the, the link to my Instagram later if you'd like to listen to it with sound. Here's another example. This building is in Latvia, in Riga. I don't know if it's still there, but it, it was there when this photo was taken. And, and again, it's another variation on the same theme, just picking features of the building and make them react with the sound. 
And I can also show you examples from other creative coders. So it's not all about me. One of them is uh, Marc Delorier, who is uh, an artist and creative coder. He's from Canada and he's also based in London. Um, this is a very, very interesting project. I'm, I like it a lot. It's called Subscapes and he has these little terrains. And again, you can see they're all part of a single collection, but because of the, the richness of the code, they generate different visual qualities, different output. Um, and you can look at, at them as a, as a unit. I think they, they hold uh, water just as one artwork, but they're also very interesting as a collection. Uh, Matt also does a lot of uh, prints. So some of his prints using just code. I have one just behind the camera here. You won't be able to see it, but it's up on, up on my wall, uh, which is another interesting thing that you can use uh, code to generate these uh, images with plotters or just traditional printing or, or screen printing even. Um, here's another example of, of a quite successful project of his. Um, I think it looks great regardless if you know that it's made with code or not, it just looks very good. Another artist who is a friend of mine, uh, William, he's, in, he's based in Paris. And this is a project of his called Dragons. Uh, I don't know if you can see dragons here or not. It's quite abstract, but it, it is something interesting that it would perhaps be challenging to create using traditional softwares for image creation. But with code, uh, you can achieve these results and just generate variation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember the number of editions that this project has, but I want to say more than 500. And they all have unique results and they all come out of the same algorithm. William also experiments with uh, pen plotters. Uh, in this case, he was he created a short animation and then the plotter is drawing each frame and then he just composes that together, uh, back together and puts it on the computer so that you can watch the animation again. Another, another variation here, this is kind of mixing uh, a ma manual process with the creative coding. So he created the animation in, com in the computer and then uh, painted them on paper uh, by hand and then assembled them back again in the computer. So, um, another variation of the theme, let's say. Another artist is Emily Shi. She's, I think she's based in the US, I'm not sure where. I don't know her personally, but I'm a big fan of her work. And the, the style is very interesting. I wouldn't say that this uh, looks like something that comes out of you know, the, the same tools that we just used to draw three rectangles. The, the level of detail is incredible. And I wish I could afford one of her prints. They're quite expensive now. They're just very, very interesting, very good to look at. Um, like I said, I, I don't know if you need to know that these come out of uh, code. Um, I, I would value that because I know I'm a creative coder. So this has value to me. But even if you, if you don't know that, I think you can still appreciate it just because it looks good. And it's not just about art. Uh, there's also a commercial application to it. So this is the last example I'm going to show you. Uh, this is a project uh, I'm currently working on. I've been working on, uh, on it for a while. It's for, for Nike. So this is an, an example of a, a generative system. So we have a design system that it is all generated. All the visuals are generated uh, by code and Whenever you go to, to a big store, a flagship store, you always see big screens and they're normally showing campaign videos. In our case, for these particular stores for Nike, they don't show videos, they, they run a real-time system that keeps generating new visuals. Um, here are some examples uh, for the store in West London. And because, because this is also this is a system, it's also responsive. So if we have different types of screens, we can generate content for them. 
uh, it's not like you need to render new videos in different formats. The, the whole thing can adapt to different size of screen in Sol. And here's the system in motion. So you get a little bit of an idea of what it looks like when with the transitions. I'll let this play out for a bit. And here is a simulation of it uh, in place. So this is how it looks like in, in the store. Obviously in the store, there's a lot more furniture. There's the actual products are there. So this is just a, a stripped down model of the, the store to show how the screens operate uh, in sync. And this is the, the facade of the store in, in Seoul, just to show the how the system can adapt to different formats. And this is very much an a commercial application of creative coding. And I think this is my time. So thank you for inviting me. You can uh, follow me on Instagram. It's three dashes with three underscores at the end. And there you can find all the links and some of the examples I showed you as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bruno. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything that we saw? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to start a, a conversation. If anyone wants to comment on something or ask a question, we have time mm -hmm. for that. I have a question, Bruno. Yeah, hi, uh, Bruno, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I really like that, uh, you know, the Nike idea that you shared i've actually seen that in the uh, shanghai store and i was wondering how did they do it so i just want to uh, know you know what what is the role coding is playing here because even before coding you know they would they would still have these televisions and you know um, very inspiring imagery will play out according to the brand system so what is what is really the role that wasn't clear to me because even even before that it was happening right you you're referring to the nike project right yeah yeah so the the difference is if you go to any store nike or any other brand zara it doesn't matter you you're probably going to have big screens in in, in the store and yeah. most of the time they're going to be playing video so those are pre-recorded assets. If you need to change, let's say a campaign, then you need to create a new asset for the format of the screen. And it needs to go in the, in the pipeline to be displayed on that particular store. Um, mm -hmm. in, in this case, we are running a, a live system. So if you need to change something, it's almost like changing something on a website. You, you go to, you go to an admin area mm -hmm. and you create a new campaign and you schedule it. You say, I want this campaign to run from this to this. And you, you set all the features of the campaign, colors, assets, everything that needs to, needs to be there. And once that's active in the system, uh, the, the code will already collect all of those assets, collect all of that information and start mixing up uh, and, and creating new layouts. So it's already piped in. So the, everything that you see is generated real time. The, Got it. We, we don't know. So I, I wrote this uh, at the company um, I'm working at at the moment. So there's a team behind it. And we don't know what is going to be on the screen because it's always um, at random. Uh, what mm. we do know is we control the, um, let's say, the, um, the limits where it can go to. So if it starts going too far, it starts looking wrong, we trim it back a bit. But inside the, the boundaries, it can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your, your question, but perhaps the advantage of that over video is that uh, you get new content and you get uh, new content faster. Mm -hmm. so pipe it okay. into the store. Uh, so basically, stuff. instead of sh instead of shooting two hundred videos, you upload you know all the content essentials like photos and videos, and it kind of creates it based on the algorithm that you set. Yes, that's correct. Ah, oh, got it. Cool. Ah, uh, thanks.
Thanks, Bruno. Bruno, hi. Hello. Uh, in this in this example that you you gave us uh, about the Nike project, mm -hmm. how how did you come up with a design system for a generative like kind of approach? How do you think about the design system for this kind of approach? It's more like a model type of thing. How do you think about it? Right. So the there, as I mentioned, there's a team behind it. So it's not just coders, there are designers as well. And there is a, um, um, I want to use the word traditional, let's, let's use it like that. So there's a traditional step uh, of design that, that comes before the, the coding. And maybe I, I was hesitating to use traditional because it is geared towards becoming a system. Um, and that will be programmed at a later stage. So whenever whenever the designers are planning for this, they're already planning it to be modular. They're already planning it that we can have, uh, let's say a grid system that can adapt to different screen formats. And then everything that's going to be slotted in the grid system needs to also have a level of flexibility. So that's all always uh, designed in a traditional way first. So you, you will see your files, your, your stills of different possibilities. And then once we have the, that body of intention layouts, then we can start bringing that into code to try to recreate all of those, but then recreate them in a way that uh, everything is dynamic. So it's not the exact same assets as they were designed, but it, it can be something different. So let's say you design something for New York, but then later you just change a few variables and suddenly you have Los Angeles and suddenly you have Seoul, et cetera. So it's, it's designed as, as an intention. And then once it's coded, uh, it, it's that plus all the variations that come from that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's kind of, it's like a modular system. So you have all these different parts glued together, I, I guess, through the, the grids or something um, like this. Yeah, I wouldn't say, so if you if you look at the, at the designs there, they're not necessarily modular in that sense where you have different components that you can just place next to each other. The the, the system is designed in a, in a modular way a, as a whole. So there's, there's something that uh, you can, it can be there uh, if the store needs it or if that uh, location needs it uh, or if that screen needs it, but it can also not be there. And you, you can slot things in, but not necessarily in the layout. So it's not like this box goes here at the top left and then it needs to find another box to go in the top right uh it's not like that it's more of um the whole storytelling because this this is 24 7 right the screens are always on so throughout the the, the day you have a timeline of things you have to keep playing so in, in that sense it is a bit more modular but not so much in the layout the the layouts are more um curated design it, it needs to be part of a, a brand guideline. It needs to follow certain rules. Otherwise, it starts becoming too crazy. It can't, can't go too experimental uh, unless that's, that is the intention of the, the brand. In this case, there are certain certain limits that we have to follow. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I get it. It's very interesting. I, I would love to play with something like this. <laughs> I'll totally do your course. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> well, thanks again, Bruno, so much. This was really fascinating. And um, it was cool to see a demo too. Two demos, actually. Yes, I'm, I'm going to sell the NFT of that Colombian flag. You, <laughs> you should. <laughs> I'll, I'll share my profits with Vanessa. We already, we already have a contract in place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, right, we'll let great, you guys. go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank you much. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of your Friday.
Yes. Happy Thank Friday, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.